I've always been fascinated with Bible prophecy. Um, ever since I was young, the Bible is actually about one-third prophecy. Some of it has been fulfilled and some of it has not. In my younger years, um, I would listen to programs on the radio because we didn't have a TV back then. And uh, I would read a lot of books. People like Hal Lindsey, Dave Hunt, and various other ones to get an idea of a timeline of when Jesus was coming and what order things are going to happen. It's very important to have the order correct. Um, if you don't, things will get jumbled up and you come up with stuff like pre-wrath rapture, which is past mid-trib but before post-trib. So it gets to be quite a jumble. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth and understand where everything goes in its proper place. And I've I've been a student of Bible prophecy for a long time. And um, I've listened to a great deal of people. Some people have been way out there. There's been some people who have promoted a Feast of Trumpets rapture. Uh, but they're pretty off the wall. A lot of them make rapture predictions that says, Oh, I've calculated out because of the Revelation 12 sign and and so therefore Jesus has to come on such and such date. Well, I don't believe that the Bible is specific as to the year and the date of that year. I do believe, however, we can know the times and seasons. And a reference to that is found in the Pauline epistle Um, of First Thessalonians chapter 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They shall not escape. But Jesus tells us, um, pray that you be counted worthy to escape. And such a thing is also written um, in Revelation. Um, to the church, where he says, um, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. See the contrast there. It is not for us, it is for them. Right now we're in the time of the Gentiles. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. After that, you will have the time of Jacob's trouble. It will be a seven-year period, the 70th week of Daniel. And at the conclusion of that, you have the second coming of Christ and the millennial reign of Christ. Now, as I said, it's, it's important to get the proper order. Um, which half do the, the uh, two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11 show up? It's the first half. Midway through the tribulation, the Antichrist will attack Israel, will take over the temple, go into the Holy of Holies, and sit down and declare himself to be God, committing the abomination that maketh desolation. Um, it is a most blasphemous thing. Um, now, as I stated in the previous video, we see these alliances going on. We know that soon there is going to be a war. Um, there's going to be several wars. You have Psalm 83. You have Gog Magog. And all of these together um, will cause a lot of death. And um, when you have wars and death, you start having more plagues, more famine, more pestilence. And all of these things are going to grow and grow. And um, 
a large portion of the Earth's population is going to be wiped out. Now, I'm going to present to you what I believe, based on um, years of reading the Bible and comparing Scripture with Scripture, what I think is going to happen in the future. And it may not sound like what Hal Lindsey has promoted um, or some others, but nonetheless, I'm going to, uh, over time, take you through these scriptures because this can be quite a lengthy study and there is no way I'm going to get it all done in one video because there is scripture after scripture after scripture and um, these scriptures are interwoven together and to see one scripture in one place and one scripture in another and to understand how they go together um, is actually quite a joyous thing when you compare scripture with scripture and you learn and and your uh, understanding grows because the Holy Spirit gives you wisdom and um, what we're going to look at as we go through the Word of God is um, how all these scriptures come together and you will see over time my reasons for stating what I state so here goes. Here's what I think is going to happen based on the Word of God. On a future Feast of Trumpets, the next feast to be fulfilled, it's going to be in the fall. It's going to be Rosh Hashanah on your calendar. It would be the first day of the seventh month, which is after Passover, following Passover. So based on that calendar, the first day of the seventh month, you have a new moon. It is the feast that has the new moon. Now, in order to declare this feast to be a feast, there would be two witnesses who would go up to the Temple Mount who would observe that the new moon had indeed come in, and they would come back and declare the beginning of this feast, and they would blow the trumpets. Um, in fact, it is a day of the blowing of the trumpets. Um, you can read that over in Leviticus. Leviticus 23. Starting in verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord even holy convocations which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. It's important to understand seasons as a part of, of the Jewish nation. And remember, we've been grafted in. We are spiritual Israel. There is a physical Israel and there is a spiritual Israel. One day, one day, glory be to God, the physical Israel will become the spiritual Israel because we've been grafted in with the true Israel. And there is a remnant of Jews, I believe, in every single generation that God has preserved. Even when Elijah was, was at the bottom and wanted God to take his life, he said, I am no better than my fathers. God reminded him that he had reserved unto himself 7,000 who had not bowed the knee unto Baal. So God has a remnant in every generation. Um, now this feast... Um, begins on the first day of the seventh month and it starts over in verse 23 and the Lord spake unto Moses saying speak unto the children of Israel saying in the seventh month in the first day of the month ye shall have a Sabbath a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation ye shall do no servile work therein but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now there are several elements here that I want to point out when comparing Scripture with Scripture. Um, first of all, it shows that it's the first day of the month. That's the new moon, okay? And we will get into more Scripture later, but Paul speaks, um, I believe in Colossians, about um, the feast and the new moon. Um, and he is referencing these feasts. Now these seven feasts, 
God ordained them. They are divine appointments. They are uh, appointments that point to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now today, brothers and sisters, we can look back in hindsight and see that through the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2, that the first four feasts were fulfilled. In fact, not only were they fulfilled, they were fulfilled down to the letter, down to the very day, down to the very hour. Everything was fulfilled exactly the way it was presented to us in Scripture. Now, this seventh month, the first day of the month, it says, ye shall have a Sabbath. Brothers and sisters, do you realize that God has said that we've entered into his Sabbath rest, Hebrews chapter 4, that we are at rest, that we are at rest in Christ. That was the whole picture of the Sabbath. Um, it is a wonderful, beautiful picture showing that the Christian has rested from his works. He can't work to get to heaven. Uh, no matter how much you strive, it can't be earned. You can't work for it. Jesus Christ already did the work. He did the work through through his work on the cross and burial, his resurrection. And then he gloriously sent to us the Spirit to seal us until the day of redemption, that no man can break the seal. And we are his, and he is ours. And we are one in Christ and in the Father. And Christ, of course, being in the Father. So um, this, this day was declared to be a Sabbath. Um, and it was a memorial blowing of trumpets. And we know, we know how Paul speaks of trumpets, okay? Um, over in First, First Thessalonians, um, it's beginning in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. There you have the trumpet. All of these things are important in Scripture. Every single word has meaning. It has weight. Um, it's not just there for any non-particular reason. Every word that Jesus spoke was full of truth and life and meaning. He never spoke an idle word. Everything he says carries weight, has deep eternal meaning and value. So... It is important to compare Scripture with Scripture and believe what it says. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the Lord Jesus Christ, the day of this rapture, um, this gathering together unto himself, he is going to um, bring the, the body of Christ, those that have died before us, with him. And they're going to be resurrected in glorified bodies just right before us. And we will meet all of them in the air. It's going to be a glorious reunion. Um, we too will have glorified eternal bodies that will never get old, uh, never have disease, uh, no health issues ever. So I, I think about that day and it's just so wondrous to me. It's, it's beyond what I can even imagine. I can't even think um, how great and glorious heaven would be except to know that Jesus is there and people that I love is there and that it just goes on forever and ever. Um, it never gets old or tiring or boring. Um, there's, there's just eternal fellowship with the saints and then there's God's holy angels and there's God himself revealed to us in three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And all those who rejected Christ at the rapture, they'll be left behind. All those who are saved will be taken up. There is no such thing as a partial rapture. All the saints will be taken. Um, 
But we see these different elements in Leviticus chapter 23. And it says, Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now this is an interesting thing, because what does Paul say over in Romans chapter 12? Turn with me over there to Romans chapter 12. To show how we ought to walk, how we should walk as Christians. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, we ourselves are... Um, we offer ourselves unto the Lord, okay? And the Holy Spirit indwells us. He lives in us. And um, we are one with Christ. And from the moment we believe the gospel, we are united with Christ for all of eternity, um, never to be separated again. So, at the rapture, on that day, a future Feast of Trumpets. Um, the feast is two days long. What happens is the, the two witnesses will go up to the Temple Mount, declare that they've seen the new moon, and come down and tell everyone, and the trumpets will begin blowing. Now, it's important to understand that a day in, in the life of a Jew does not begin when the sun rises. It begins when the sun goes down. And so that's the beginning of the day. Um, the end of the day is when the sun goes down, not at midnight. See, their line of thinking is different than ours in Western culture as Gentiles. Uh, to us, our day is over when the sun goes down, or on the clock it would be at midnight, but not so for them. Um, there's, their day begins in the evening. It's a new day when the sun goes down, and it follows to the next day um, when the sun goes down. So, when this Feast of Trumpets happens, and by the way, um, I don't know which year it's going to be, and even if one were to know what year it was going to be, you wouldn't know which day it's going to be, because the feast is two days long. So, after the blowing of the trumpets, okay, the, the, the two witnesses declare that the feast day begins because they have to see the new moon. If they're unable to see the new moon on that day, it's automatically celebrated the next day. Now, the interesting thing is with this two-day feast, it would incorporate every Christian believer in the whole world. So, the church began on Pentecost, um, and it became composed of both Jews and Gentiles. And likewise, the rapture of the church will include some Jews. Um, contrary to what the Andersonites teach. Now, when that happens, as we are being raptured, Moses and Elijah are going to be coming down to begin their work. Um, I believe this is what's going to happen. As we get raptured, we go to heaven. Moses and Elijah will come down, and Moses will do that which he did in the Old Testament. He will find priests and sanctify them and take them up to the Temple Mount. Now, folks, if you've watched the news at all, <laughs> you know that the Temple Mount is a very volatile place. Uh, there have been instances of, of clashes going on um, and all kinds of problems. Uh, the Jews want to be able to pray up there. They want to be able to worship. They've been told no. It's under the control of the Jordanians. And um, it is still the time of the Gentiles. But when the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled, that's going to be done. And what I believe is going to happen is there will be a temple up there. And I believe the Dome of the Rock is going to be destroyed. 
as well as the um, Alaska Mosque which is over and off to the side. So those areas are going to be destroyed. There's going to be a temple up there. When CNN and all these news people show <laughs> Moses and Elijah going up to the Temple Mount with a bunch of priests to blow the trumpet to declare this uh, Feast of Trumpets, then there's going to be a war. And that's what's going to get started. You're going to have your first wave of people, which is Psalm 83. The, the Arabs are going to be enraged uh, like, like they've never been enraged. It's going to just throw them into a tizzy because they're going to see this happening. Um, it's quite possible that Elijah, who has been known in the past to call down fire out of heaven, to call down fire to destroy these buildings, to clear everything off. Um, just like in the days against Baal and the Baal worship, um, how Elijah himself opposed 450 prophets of Baal, um, including Jezebel, who was their leader, who was the, the king's wife. So, you also need to understand that this is going to be a different dispensation, okay? Um, it will be the time for that. It is time for God to turn his attention back to Israel to deal with the children of Israel so that they are prepared for the coming of their Messiah. He already came once. They rejected him. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, he stood before Pontius Pilate. Um, and Pontius Pilate asked the people, What shall I do with your king? He was presented. And what did they say? Away with him. We have no king but Caesar. Well, God's going to deal with the children of Israel. And God is very serious. He says the very last words of the Old Testament. Turn with me, if you will, to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. Verse 5. Behold... I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. There's going to be some great things. There's going to be signs and wonders. Um, the Bible speaks in Revelation chapter 11, which I need to get into another time, but we see great things happening because of Moses and Elijah. and. Um, you might ask, why Moses and Elijah? Well, we see them on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses represents the law, Elijah the prophets. We know that God promised to send Elijah back. And there are special circumstances concerning Moses. So, while this does need to go into in more depth, um, suffice it to say at this point, um, Moses and Elijah are going to be witnesses to the children of Israel because the law and the prophets are a witness unto them. Um, in fact, Abraham spoke quite clearly in Luke. Um, Luke chapter 16, the uh, story between the rich man uh, and Lazarus. And uh, the rich man goes to hell and Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham. And... Verse 27, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, that's the two witnesses unto them. And we know that Elijah is going to be the prophet that comes. Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And how true that is. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the eternal Son of God, rose from the dead, and most of the Jews rejected him. They did not believe him. Um, so, we see that um, Moses and Elijah will come. The 
Temple Mount is going to be cleared and it's going to be done uh, where the world sees it. And it is going to cause a war, a huge war. And it's not going to be a war um, that the Arabs win. The first wave is going to be the Psalm 83 group. Those are the nations that form a ring directly around Israel. They will attack first. And while they are busy attacking, a second wave is going to be forming and getting ready to attack. That is Gog Magog. They are the second ring of nations around um, Israel. And I will go into more depth with these people later, but I just want to explain today, since it's I'm speaking about the rapture itself and what's going to take place, um, is how the whole thing is triggered. It's going to be triggered because of uh, huge anger on the part of the Arabs when they see Moses and Elijah going up onto the Temple Mount, having the priest blow the trumpet. And it's going to start um, these wars. And God himself, of course, will intervene. He wants it to happen so that he can do great, wonderful things um, so that the children of Israel will believe. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this video for now. Um, but there is so much more to go over, so much more depth, that um, it's going to require several. So until next time, God bless you all, and take care.